This is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to the inner verse, the podcast where we expand our hearts and align our minds with the power of infinite potential. I'm your host, Chance. And if you've been tuning in over the years, I'm happy to say that today's guest probably needs no introduction. With shows like Stranger Things demonstrating a fictionalized version of real life mind control programs like MK Ultra, the scandals revolving around Hollywood figures and sexual abuse, and the recent bringing to light of sex slave trafficking by billionaires like Jeffrey Epstein, It seems that conspiracies are getting more mainstream every day, yet the cultural conditions that create these conundrums are still yet to crumble. And on top of this, we've got more and more military leakage of UFO and UFO-related programs that are hitting the internet faster than you could possibly imagine, honestly. You probably noticed from the episode title that this show constitutes part two of a conversation started earlier in the year featuring the research and compassionate but realistic perspective of my favorite jack-of-all-trades internet researcher and content creator, the human known online as Eurasoul. As an expert on all things internet and technology at large, Eurasoul is the founder and developer of an excellent social media website called Eureka.org that you can use to ditch the diabolical mainstream platforms that seek to dumb us down and divide us against one another. Apart from that, you can find Eurasoul's writings across many alternative content sites, and his incredibly robust Steemit blog features many articles containing information and source material for the variety of topics we're going to hit today. So check the show notes for links to these writings and videos for more context on any of the subjects we're about to discuss. We're picking up right where we left off last time to continue the conversation about government or military whistleblowers and corporate insiders who have given us a disturbing look at heartless actions and conspiracies perpetrated by those with disproportionate levels of power and control over others. If you haven't heard part one and you aren't particularly well versed in the main talking points of deep conspiracy research, you may want to go and have a look at that episode where we discussed the impoverishment of our health and wellness by big pharmaceutical companies and the addictive and destructive drugs they deal, how the CIA and other agencies manipulate public opinion on just about everything, but especially war. We touched on the deep state and shadow government and finished off with discussion of whistleblowers who have come out against the official story of 9-11. All that and more will be linked in the show notes, but today's content can also stand alone as we will be hitting some new topics this time around. And if you're wondering why conspiracy is even a subject matter on this show that's so often about more love and light things, my answer to that is that I have found a great deal of personal spiritual growth and development in myself by taking a hard look at the distortions caused by evil in the world. And as the great occult researcher Michael Tessarian often says, conspiracy work is spiritual work. Because if all is self, simply ignoring parts of the reality spectrum because they're uncomfortable means that you're continually ignoring what most needs healing. Just like a sick person who refuses to believe they're ill until they eventually collapse and require emergency help. 
If we are to fully unfold and expand our consciousness, this literally means becoming more aware of everything, both good and evil. And so by embracing difficult perspectives, we can find our own personal growth by discovering what is heartless and distorted in the world and seeking to end our connection or participation with it. None of us have time to look at everything and do deep research on it all. So I'm especially grateful to beings like you're a soul who put massive time and energy into investigating the truth and packaging it for the rest of us to consume more easily. So buckle your seatbelts and burn your sage because we're about to dive into some of the most insane human behaviors in our modern age or any other with the white mage of exposing the deranged and internet crusader who's healing the haters. My good friend and yours, you're a soul. Welcome back to the show, man. I think this is your fifth visit. So you're officially the most featured guest on the show of all time, which I'm pretty happy about. How's it going over in the UK? <laughs> hey, Charles. It's good to know. I'm great. Thanks. Uh, wow. What an amazing introduction. Um, uh, I feel, feel honored to be here. And yeah, I'm really excited to uh, go through all this mountain of information that we have. It's the mountain for sure. It's like a planet of information. But you just shared with me through an email an analysis by the UFO researcher Richard Dolan about the leaked Admiral Wilson documents that detail deep black UFO related programs well beyond formal government oversight. What can you tell us about this leak, what it reveals, and the current state of research into the area? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I've only put a few hours of looking into this. There's other people who have, who have really put a lot more time into this than I have, and you can easily find those that material on, on YouTube, particularly via Richard Dolan. But as I understand it, these are a series of documents that were somehow accessed via um, someone who who was involved with UFO conferences, basically, just uh, somebody who's interested in the subject. And the short version is that there are a series of documents that note, uh, that, that describe meetings that, w- that took place between various high-level military people, um, such as Admiral Wilson and uh, basically scientific individuals who were trying to get to the bottom of um, various projects that were being undertaken by private contractors, military contractors, to basically go out into the world and retrieve crashed UFOs and reverse engineer the technology. And, you know, this this kind of subject has been spoken about by numerous other people before. Um, One of the main, probably better known people uh, or projects would be the Sirius Project, the Disclosure Project um, with Dr. Stephen Greer. And apparently he was actually present at some of the meetings that are documented in this this leak um, in the 1990s. So, yeah, I mean, the reason why Richard Dolan and others are excited about this is because although there are other documents describing these kinds of meetings and subjects, uh, particularly the book uh, The Day After Roswell by um, Colonel Corso, which is probably one of the best books on this topic, which I definitely recommend everyone take a look at, to collect, take a look at and read uh, in full. But these documents are, let's say, some of the more verifiable and uh, provable, provably real um, on this subject that exists. So that, that's why it's kind of a big deal. And although they don't often name everyone who's involved, they they do take you through, for example, um, meetings that were taken that took place with lawyers uh, representing some of the corporations as the, as the military people tried to, the government people tried to um, kind of get more information about these secret projects. And yeah, it's just uh, it's a really good insight into the the way that uh, private corporations, private interests, and the government of America, at least. Uh, do work together, don't work together, but basically both hold a huge amount of information about topics such as UFOs, which they keep secret. And um, as Richard Dolan points out, uh, the, the government apparently in America, being as I'm not in America, I don't know all these details firsthand, but he was saying how um, the government a few years ago or not so long ago made a, made a claim that, oh, we've just started looking into UFOs and these kinds of things. Um Whereas these documents are much older, and, and within the notes from these this, these leaked meetings, it talks about um, how the people involved had seen the notes on all of these UFO sightings, which were presumably were military notes, which means that, you know, yeah, they were obviously researching this stuff a long, long time before the government um, has told the public they were, certainly. So it's just yet another example of how the US government and probably most governments just lie repeatedly to the people 
Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll probably claim, oh, it's for national security reasons. But, you know, in reality, it's, it's just basically so they can hide what they're doing from, from everyone. So that they, you know, they, firstly, they can have a, a power gain over other countries, perhaps, and protect themselves. So you could say that's a national security risk. But on the other hand, it's, it's basically a part, I would say, about having power gain over the people who, um, you know, who don't know any better and don't know to ask certain questions about getting certain technologies that could help them, let's say. Um, so, yeah, it's a whole rabbit hole, but definitely do go and check out um, some of the videos on Richard Dolan's channel on this subject to get more information. And, uh, it's definitely something that should be more talked about. And I don't know whether I don't know whether this recent push on Facebook and other social networks to, to get together half a million people to go and um, rush Area 51, I don't know how much how connected that is to these these papers but they could well be i actually have not heard of that initiative but it seems like it would be pretty hard to stop 500,000 people from coming into the base <laughs> if they all just migrated there it would be like occupy area 51 <laughs> exactly yeah yeah i mean who knows what would happen i mean i did joke about it it's kind of like well they know that this is being discussed so if it actually happens you know obviously they'll know in advance so how hard is it to to hide teleportation equipment? Probably not all that hard. I mean, you just teleported somewhere else. But uh, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see what what <laughs> whether that actually happens. So you've heard of teleportation equipment. I've heard just about every crazy thing under the sun when it comes uh, to what might be going on in Area Fifty One. A personal favorite entry level documentary of mine is the recent work by filmmaker Jeremy Corbell about the life and times of the. Uh, very interesting and enigmatic character. Uh, for some reason, I'm blanking on his name. You know what I'm talking Bob, about. Bob Lazar. Thank you, Bob Lazar. Yes, Bob Lazar, Area 51 and UFOs. That's a great uh, documentary to check out if you want to hear some very credible testimony about the topic. And what I think is interesting is that there's possibly two things going on. There may be UFOs that could be extraterrestrial in origin. But then there's lots of evidence of what you would call breakaway civilization in the, in the technologies that humans might be utilizing. And going back as far as potentially Nazi Germany, there are leaked documents and testimonies from individuals that claim that flying saucer anti-gravitic technology has been around since at least that long and maybe was in the hands of the Third Reich. And as we explore these conspiracy topics, we inevitably find out that the Third Reich didn't really even perish and it actually just migrated, broke itself up and migrated into other countries. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that there's almost like a arms race going on to between countries in secret to develop these types of advanced weaponry, weaponry and technology? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, without firsthand experience, it's hard to know which uh, claims that people have made are actually 100% accurate and which ones aren't. But it's fairly clear that at the end of World War II, Operation Paperclip and other other moves basically resulted in uh, the Russians, as I understand it, taking away a lot of physical information um, from Germany and their scientific research projects and the Americans taking actual people, um, scientists, mainly, as I understand it, in quite a large number back to America and integrate them into NASA and teaching institutes and so on and research facilities. And part of that was, uh, you know, to get their rocket technology from Werner von Braun and who was well known and went on to be quite high up in NASA. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, they had this concept of the Nazi bell as well, which was another kind of top secret project, which people speculated about being involved with time space distortion and all kinds of, you know, more advanced things than simple rocket technology or from our perspective now, simple technology. Um, yeah, obviously there's a lot of discussion on that. There's various evidences pointing in different directions. There are whistleblowers from alleged uh, forthright Nazi bases in Canada and America underground bases actually operated by Nazis today who claim they were born into those camps and trained to become super soldiers and things like that. Um, you know, I can't verify any of that. I don't know how true that is or it isn't. I'm not going to say that it's true, but um, there's definitely people claiming those things. And uh, what we do know for sure, though, is that many Nazis definitely did go into the American um, system and I would say went on to shape elements of the American government, um, you know, obviously those people having high intelligence and being given access to secret programs, they're going to wield a certain amount of power, um, probably more power than the average soldier fighting in World War II against Nazis would have wanted them to have had. But 
uh, that's what happened. But, um, um, you know, they were, Nazis also had a role into play in the formation of the EU. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, definitely those things happened. The fine details definitely are something that we can debate or argue about indefinitely until, you know, maybe some of the um, some of the government entities that exist today become a bit more honest and open the doors a bit more. But um, certainly, the technology that that we see the militaries using publicly is way, way, way behind what they actually have. And um, I mean, there's there's a quote from, I'm not remembering his name at the moment, but there's a quote from one, one of the guys who ran the Skunk Works, basically the, the kind of secret uh, technology development um, facility in America, where he, I think he was head of Lockheed Martin or someone, one of those big companies. And he basically said publicly, whatever you've seen in Star Trek or any of these shows, um, we've been there and done it already long ago, basically. So literally everything you can imagine from science fiction, he's claiming that they've already done. So that would include traveling to other galaxies, um, teleportation, uh, you know, manifesting things via a replicator type thing, uh, you know, all that stuff. Literally, he publicly said that. And if you if you look at just the accepted public domain material regarding teleportation, for example, uh, you know, it's accepted that, that on a small scale that's already been done. Uh, it's not secret. So, you know, really, it's just how do you scale that up from that small level to larger objects? And, you know, it seems like without knowing all the details, it seems like that's the kind of thing that wouldn't be dramatically impossible, of a, you know, an impossible challenge. You know, once you figure out the principle, you can usually adapt it. So, yeah, I, I think the evidence points to that. And I think the bigger question is why are they not allowing it into the public domain? And, you know, as usual, that seems to basically come down to the people involved wanting to be more powerful than other people. And uh, there's all kinds of theories about what they've done with it, you know, who the, the different civilizations they've contacted and where they've gone and deals they've done. And, you know, every single person that seems to speak on this seems to have a completely different idea of it. And I don't really feel like a lot of these people really know what they're talking about, but some of them do seem to. And, and they, they're the ones that seem to be a bit more grounded in, in their ideas and and can provide some evidence. So I have an open mind on it. And, um, you know, I've had my own close encounters of various kinds along the way. So I know these things are possible uh, in terms of what actually has ha and hasn't happened. You know, I'll, I'll leave that to the whistleblowers to, to enlighten me. When we do talk about whistleblowers, I feel like there's some, some discrediting information out there. You mentioned the phenomenon of some people coming forward and claiming to be super soldiers, for example. And the majority of individuals like that I've ever looked into, I felt strongly that they were probably involved in some kind of a program, but it was more likely that they had been manipulated or mind controlled to become a very ideal candidate to spread disinformation and discredit things that are actually very true. And do you feel that that's definitely a component when it comes to the disclosure that psychological warfare is the first weapon against keeping the population? Uh, aware of what's actually happening? Yes, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, my understanding of super soldier technology and programs and so on is that it started out with the, well, I don't know if it started with MK Ultra, but it certainly founded around the concept of, of being able to fragment a person's personality so that you can program them and have multiple personalities within one person, um, which would make, I mean, if you think about the idea of the Manchurian candidate, very old concept, uh, whereby you've got an undetectable spy, basically, who, who has multiple personalities and one of them can be a spy, one of them can be an average person, one of them can be a pilot and so on. And then something somehow triggers them to switch from one personality to, to another. So it basically means that you could have somebody who day to day appears to be relatively average, then can switch into being this amazing psychic soldier or some other kind of soldier. Then they can switch into a disinformation agent, then they can switch into something else. So... Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of a, of a it's a real challenge to try to understand what's actually going on within any individual person, and I don't think anyone can really claim to 100% know that unless they've spent time with these people and actually dive deeply into their sub and unconscious um, and you know deprogram them a bit. Um, but people like, for example, Michael Prince or um, he has another name, James. Uh, I forgot his last name now, but he's been interviewed on um, the Basis Project, who I work with sometimes, numerous times. He's in jail now in, in England. He basically married, um, and the heir to uh, I think it's Walmart or one of those big companies in America. He, he married uh, the daughter of 
of that family. And then it's a long story, but basically he ended up getting arrested and put in jail for um, sharing pornographic pictures of her on Facebook. Um, it's a very strange story. But there's like pictures of him in the Daily Mail, you know, with um, one of the princes of in Britain with his giant diamond and all this kind of stuff. So he, he comes out and tells these stories about how he's involved in in the establishment and lords and all these people and knows all these you know, top people in the military. And it sounds a bit crazy and far-fetched, but then actually, hang on, there's pictures of him with them. And there's pictures of him, you know, wearing a US military uniform uh, and all this stuff. So there's definitely corroborating evidence to back up the claims. It's just, you know, some of the claims he makes are easily disproven uh, as well. So there's definitely a mixture in there of of what some people that I know would call bullshit and smarties. And basically you have to be able to figure out how to separate the bullshit and the smarties uh, to get to the truth. Um, and for me, that means really just pay attention and focusing and questioning and and comparing, you know, what's what's possible and what isn't and what I know. And just you just got to make your own mind up at the end of the day, I think. This is a really interesting subject matter, actually, because whenever we're looking at people with multiple personality disorder in established psychology, there is actually a phenomenon where someone can switch personalities and all of their unique biorhythms and markers actually change with the personality shift. We all have like a baseline blood pressure, a baseline EKG, heart rhythm, all kinds of different factors that are measurable in our biology that are unique to us whenever you look at it as a constellation. I believe the EKG, like your heartbeat, is actually pretty much as unique as a fingerprint. And whenever people switch personalities, it switches these markers as if there's an entirely different person inhabiting the body. And I find that really interesting because we know also many anecdotal stories of like, say, a mother that lifted a car off of their child after an accident in a feat of superhuman strength. And if we apply that potential to someone who's been brutally traumatized and had their consciousness fragmented and compartmentalized, it seems relatively possible to me that you could actually create an alter personality that had superhuman strength and superhuman abilities. Kind of like the recent movie, um, can't rem- remember the movie, I think it's Glass. It was the one that was like by M. Night Shyamalan. There's a main character called the Beast and he's a uh, schizophrenic. And whenever the Beast character comes out, he basically turns into the Hulk and can just like smash things and destroy things. Those movies actually have a lot of clues about what's really going on in the world. I think it might be partly why M. Night Shyamalan is mostly ridiculed by uh, (laughs) the the other Hollywood people and by reviewers in the mainstream. So I just bring that up as a point that even with someone that's claiming to have these experiences as a super soldier and seems like just a regular person or even kind of like, I don't know, um, not credible or inconsistent, there's still the potential that buried inside them is this other alter personality that really is literally a super soldier. So it's it's a really crazy rabbit hole to get into uh, in general. But while we're on the topic of, you know, this these secret government programs, you mentioned underground military bases to get back to UFOs and ETs. Let's talk about the Phil Schneider story and about, you know, what's your estimation of what's going on with what are known as dumbs or deep underground military bases? Sure, yeah. I mean, obviously, the nature of these is that they're secret. So uh, unless you're somebody who's been involved in their construction or using them in some way, then you're guessing to a certain extent or just trying to do your best to put the puzzle pieces together. Uh, as my, as I've been working as uh, you know, along, along the way in the last few years with the BASIS project, which is literally set up to explore that exact subject, and it's been running since the 1980s, uh, I have had access to a lot of information relating to that and listened to a lot of testimonies from different people. Um, you know, I'm not in a position to say exactly what is and isn't happening down there, but the basic picture that's, that's, that's said is that there's networks of very large bases around pretty much the whole world, often in remote areas, sometimes under cities or airports, and they're all connected by magnetic maglev trains, most of them are, um, and they've, they've got nuclear-powered mining equipment that can cr- cut very large tunnels at quite high speed. So, you know, what would seem impossible to create this network of very deep bases of, you know, all around the world tied together with with big tunnels actually hasn't taken all that long. 
Um, and apparently some of them are under the ocean as well, and submarines go into them and that kind of thing. So it's like a whole other reality on planet Earth, basically, that's, that's very deep underground. And this allows uh, numerous different projects to, to, to happen, uh, ranging from obviously the basic idea of survival in terms of if there's a big war or event on the surface, then large numbers of people can, can survive down there. But in terms of secret projects, I mean, they can do pretty much anything down there and no one's really going to know because who, how are you going to, no one can break in down there basically, can they? Unless you're, unless you're literally a special forces team or maybe uh astral traveler and that kind of thing that can do these things. And um, yeah, so in terms of Phil Schneider, uh, I, he was one of the first people I heard talking about this many years ago. He's passed on now. And uh, I mean, his death is in itself an interesting subject, but appears that he was murdered honestly yeah exactly yeah um so yeah i'll, I'll touch on that in a moment but uh, he was as i recall a geologist who worked on these bases basically and um participated in their construction and he told a story sometime as an older man after leaving that those projects where he he claims that he basically they as i recall they dug a they dug a hole into a certain area and um, entered into the hole and basically there were noises and smells and things coming up there and, uh, and they were ETs down there basically as I recall like little grey type ETs maybe I'm, my memory is not perfect of that I haven't listened to him talk about it for a long time but that's I think you said they were the tall grey variety like your classic abduction scenario aliens okay yeah and, and he basically talks about how they had a battle with these um, characters and he lost some fingers in a, in a fight he said he had a pistol and he pulled them out and killed one of them uh, who, and the entity sort of sent an energy field from his chest to him and took some of his fingers off and he basically said a whole bunch of I think he said green braids went down there and fought them and many of them died and so it was a big battle basically um, I think it was a, was it a Dolce base Dolce I'm not sure now which, which base it was but um that's his, that's his story. And then, you know, when he went out after, after all this happened and went giving talks, I think he was warned off, as I understand, from giving these talks and he had difficulty doing that. And then, as you say, at some point he was found dead. And I was just reading again, you know, his, uh, the notes on his death. And basically initially it was said that he just died in, in, I think of a heart issue or something like that. And he was quite old and, you know, he did have serious health problems. Um, but then when the autopsy was performed, uh, it turned out that he actually had a ligature tied around his neck with a with a knot around it. And it's like, well, how did you miss that? You know, you can't just exactly miss something like that. And it wasn't even going to have been revealed, but I believe his ex-wife requested and insisted that she see the body. And right. that was when they admitted, oh, yeah, there's this wrapped around his neck, this cord. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, we just missed that. Yeah, we, we thought it was a heart attack, but as it turns out, yeah, obviously he's been suffocated. Oh, right. <laughs> I mean, somebody should have lost their job for that sort of level of incompetence, but obviously it's more likely that it was just covered up. But I don't know, there's lots of questions about that. I mean, if you were going to cover up something like that, then wouldn't you just remove the ligature and make it look, you know, like it was a natural heart attack? I don't know, but um, definitely an interesting case. And um there are other, uh, like Michael Prince and other people I mentioned who claim to have been in these bases and um, given details about them. Um, James Casbolt is his other name. That's, that's the name he's better known as. Yeah, so, I mean, there are lots of stories coming out f over the years from people like David Wilcock and people like that who I think are quite questionable in terms of their information. But uh, basically saying, oh, you know, the, people have been hearing these big explosions, these big noises around the world, and, and you know, we can see lots of videos of people who have, who have recorded them and actually those are the sounds of nuclear weapons being discharged into these bases to kill them off basically like there's, there's been this cleanup method um, process underway and the good guys are going in with small nuclear weapons and destroying these bases um you know this is something that's completely unverifiable and you know i mean even if even if a whistleblower came and told me that i would be unlikely to tell the world about that because i lost the point you know there's no there's no I can't show you any evidence that that's real. So, you know, I'm just opening myself up to ridicule. But, you know, these kinds of people apparently seem to think that that if they have a big enough um, bubble around them of sort of authority, perceived authority, then they can say all this stuff and people just go along with it. But, um, yeah, so difficult to say exactly what's going on. But um, another person that's worth mentioning, actually, is uh, Larry Warren, who um, is, uh, is, he was... Um, 
part of a security team who worked in uh, the military, uh, U.S. military base near Rendlesham Forest, which is not too far from where I am right now. Um, that's actually the location nearby where I saw my first ET vehicle um, very close up. And uh, there's a documentary but currently just due to be released pretty soon called Capel Green, um, which tells his story and the other people there's story. And it really is definitely one to watch. It's, it's such a different version of events to the ones that people have known from that time. And I don't know, maybe some people have never heard of this, but Rendlesham Forest, the Rendlesham Forest um, event, I guess you could call it, was probably the most famous UFO story from Britain in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And um, the short version is it's an American military base there. As it turns out, apparently they were housing way too many nuclear weapons there, according to the treaties that were in place. Um, and that seems to have attracted uh, visits from you know non-human consciousness. And um, yeah, so this story goes that on this night there were a bunch of people on guard there and they saw these lights coming down. One flew down the wrong way. It didn't land. It was just a light. And they were watching it. And, and one of these went off into the forest nearby and landed and they, they sent a security team out with weapons to go investigate. And basically they found a, a pyramid shaped UFO type object um, with symbols on it and sending energy out to them. And one of them's had um, like being, it's, it's very much like a kind of Close Encounters movie plot line. Um, one of them actually received binary codes, which he was writing down afterwards. And uh, one guy, um, apparently went crazy afterwards like a very religious guy from deep south and killed himself and this whole story that basically larry one has told um and that as i understand it, it's going to be in the plot lines of this documentary but the reason i mention it is because part of his story is that he says that after these encounters um he he went back to his room and decided to call his mom i think he'd been debriefed at one point and told not to speak about this to anyone uh, and he went to the phone box almost straight away and called his mum in America and started talking about it. And then the phone cut off, went dead. And, um, and you know, the, the MPs came along and, and took him in and said, well, you do realise all these calls are monitored. Uh, we told you not to talk about it kind of thing. And, uh, and then he claims that basically he was taken into a debriefing session where they showed him, you know, secret footage of UFO vehicles and that kind of thing. And basically, I suppose, to sort of um, help him process what he'd experienced. And... Um, and then he says he ended up in a very deep underground base and he actually saw AT technology and uh, he said that um, uh, long tunnels going out into the North Sea um, near Lower Soft so that these vehicles could go out and leave without being seen from land uh, and that kind of thing. So, you know, he's somebody who um, definitely was there at the Rendlesham event, as far as I understand it. I don't think that's contested. Some people have argued with some of the things that he said, but, um, you know, he's one of the few people I can think of who, uh, can prove that he was at that base, uh, I think, as far as I know, and um, and has actually said, yeah, I've been underground and seen UFO vehicles and things like that. So, um, yeah, definitely go and check out Larry Warren and um, the Cable Green movie, I think, comes out anytime soon. It's amazing how much information is really there if you want to go look for it and how this concept connects to just about every part of the civilized world. Actually, the city I'm in, where I've lived basically my entire life, which is in Southwest Missouri, a town called Springfield, not a huge city, probably under 200,000 people, mostly college students. But there's a local legend that is very true and verifiable of deep underground tunnel systems beneath the city. And there are places where you can go and get into the tunnels, but you can only go so far before things are blocked off or doors are locked. And people claim to have explored these tunnels and found storehouses of supplies and food and emergency gear and things of that nature. So we definitely know that even in a small town America type of setting, there are extensive underground tunnel networks that nobody knows who owns them. Nobody knows really what they're supposed to be there for, but they do exist. And then in pop culture, it's coming up more and more. In the introduction, I mentioned the TV show Stranger Things. In the newest season of that show, which I guiltily admit that I've watched because I'm fascinated to see how see how the conspiracy culture is hitting the mainstream and what they're doing with this. And there's a lot of troubling elements of that show, especially related to the treatment of children. But uh, there's a plot line in this newest, most recent season about an underground experimental base that the Soviets had because the show set in the 80s right underneath this small town. 
and the characters actually find a secret elevator in their mall that goes like miles underground. And then they have to take a tunnel for several miles before they even reach the main base. So it's mainstreaming more and more that there are these deep underground military bases. I don't know why it would be such a big topic all over the place if there wasn't something to it. And I'm with you in being highly skeptical of certain individuals like David Wilcock and just in general, the the whole Gaia TV thing, because to me, that looks like a billions of dollars worth company that is doing very little to actually help the world other than just creating sort of inner so so-called spiritual entertainment. But I mean, I've seen troubling stuff from programs there like promoting Luciferian and even eugenics type ideas and just weird stuff. And with David Wilcock, it seems that most of his information comes from one source, which is a guy named Corey Good who claims to know everything about everything and is almost like weekly coming out with updates about all the heroics and exploits that he's been on on other planets and meeting other aliens and being invited to like galactic councils and things like that. And to me, whenever you encounter an individual that their narrative is essentially, I'm special, I'm the special chosen one, I tend to run away from those type of uh, characters and not really give their credence to what they're saying. So it's the individuals that aren't really fame seekers like Bob Lazar, we mentioned, who spent 30 years completely quiet about his experiences until a filmmaker wanted to create this newer documentary. Those are the more credible sources who this guy, you know, he's had a career in science in material sciences and chemistry for decades, even after he came out and did his whistleblowing thing. To me, that looks like somebody who just revealed everything they knew publicly so that there would be no more threat against them because there's nothing else that they could give up. And if something happened to them, then it would be more obvious that they were telling the truth. Those are the type of whistleblowers that I find a lot of credibility with. But back to you seeing UFOs at Rendlesham Forest. Can you talk a little bit more about what you saw there? I'm curious about your experience. Sure, yeah. I just wanted to quickly say about David Wilcock. He did actually put out a public statement saying that, yes, Guy on TV is Luciferian. Um, and basically he quit. Um, after working there for years, he, he basically couldn't carry on and wrote a massive letter about it. So, um, you know, kudos to him for that. Uh, I don't think he is necessarily a bad or totally corrupt person. I just think he's a bit, um, bit too Hollywood for me, if you see what I mean, a little bit too, um, uh, I don't know, false, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, he's not. Someone can be led in the wrong direction if they are gullible enough and if they have a big platform or they just are way too focused on their own career, if you will. That's what you mean by Hollywood, I think. Yeah. And willing to do whatever to get themselves out there, even if it means telling fantastic stories that don't have really any verifiability. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it ties into insecurity in general, and, and that we'll probably come onto that with with Epstein and and the whole thing with with the children and all that. These problems that have been in the news recently, but a lot of it does come down to a lack of self acceptance, self self empowerment, and being willing to just buy into someone else's hype about you and saying, yeah, I'll go along with that, you know. But um, but yeah, in terms of my my encounters with, um, I mean, I don't really know exactly what to call these these vehicles. They are vehicles, I would say that. But um, this is a long, long, long thing to explain. But um, the first time this happened, I was about 22, I think. And um, I was make, making music. I was visiting some friends. Uh, and uh, we've been making music quite a lot. And, you know, definitely there's a connection between sound. Obviously, there's a connection between sound and consciousness. Um, sacred geometry and many, obviously, vibration and frequencies of, are at the core, really, of manifest reality. They're, they're, they are fundamental to everything we experience. So I wasn't so aware of that at the time, but um, I had a crash course in it. Uh, basically, as a result of reading, the short, the short version of this is we only had a very small room where we were making music, and there wasn't enough room for all of us to make music at the same time. There were three of us. And my other two friends were a bit more advanced at making music than I was. So, you know, I, I chose to sort of hang back and let them do what they were doing. And, and, you know, I'd come in now and again. And so I was just looking for other things to do. And my friend had a bunch of books lying around. So I picked them up and was just reading through them. And really wasn't expecting, these were subjects I'd never heard of before at the time. I was really just in, amazed by them. One of them was Sacred Geometry, um, Robert Lawler's book. Uh, one of them was a book, I, if I recall correctly, um, 
Uh, there's one about Kundalini, maybe, and these kinds of subjects. And I'd never heard of anything about these before. And I, as soon as I read the Sacred Geometry book, my mind was just like running at a million miles an hour. It was literally like questions I'd had my whole life suddenly were getting answered. Bang, 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 bang. All these different questions about why temples were like they were, why religion was like it was, why this had happened, why that had happened. So, like, oh, yeah, okay. And it's literally like my whole being filled up with light. Like my mind suddenly started putting everything in its right place and suddenly started to connect all these dots together in a way that I've never heard anyone, never even met anyone even talk about these things before in this way. And um, and it, it basically triggered me to open my consciousness up um, to very specific frequencies, new new thought forms, new angles. And somewhere along the line, I went out to a bookshop and tried to find some other interesting books. And I, I bought one about Zen, Buddhism, one about Buddhism, one about Wiccan stuff, something like that. Um, but it was the Zen one that really triggered me again. And in combination of reading these ancient texts from Zen tradition and studying sacred geometry, it just really opened me up to, again to another level. And I suddenly realized everything's one, isn't it? Right, wow, everything literally is one. And I'd never thought of that before. Um, it's just like the most obvious thing ever, but at the same time, you can't see the wood for the trees. And, uh, you know, when you're busy living your life, you don't pause often to realize, oh, hang on a minute, everything is actually connected, isn't it? I mean, my atoms are vibrating, the air is vibrating. Where does that, I mean, there's a boundary. I can say I start and finish here, but it's still actually all the same soup of energy, you know, just with forms inside of it, isn't it? So that was what I suddenly realized. And then I was like, well, if that's true, then that means that, First of all, I'd experienced telepathy as well during that time, and I had done previously in my life, and I knew psychic things were real. So I was like, well, if that's the case, then why can't I communicate with anyone anywhere in the whole universe? I mean, obviously I can. There's no reason why I can't. So, And as soon as I did that, like within, I couldn't tell you how long it was, but not very long at all, I was basically internally in a completely different reality, and, and I was actually talking to beings on another planet. And I basically thought, you know, it's a bit like daydreaming. You know, like you could just daydream anything. And, and because I hadn't done this deliberately, I wasn't exactly planning on it. And and I just didn't really fully know what to do with it. I was just like, well, okay, I'm here. Well, I'll just do what I can with it. It's a bit like being in a dream. You don't know how you got there. Um, you're just there and there's stuff happening. So I was like, okay, well, fine. Um, and I, I have the ability to ground myself. So I just sort of grounded myself and said, well, whatever happens, happens. And I'll just do my best with it. I'm not going to go crazy or anything. I'll just, you know, learn from it. And so when I came back to this kind of physical reality, I um, did start to get a bit worried because I was I didn't really know what was happening. I thought maybe I was going crazy. Um, I just didn't really know. And so I, but, but I knew how I got to being that state. And I knew that I got there through a logical progression of thinking about reality and oneness and communication and those things. So it wasn't like, you know, I'd just been walking down the street and suddenly I was talking to an extraterrestrial. It was more like I'd gone through this process that I could understand and relate to other people um, but I still didn't fully understand what was happening and and then I started noticing unusual phenomena happening in physical reality as well like um, I was sleeping up in my friend's roof area in his house I'd never been up there before it wasn't really a proper bedroom or anything it's just a house full so I went up there and it had a window in the roof uh, that you can really open um, and I noticed it had a smiley face stuck on it with with a third eye and I was like, oh, like three eyes. Uh, okay, I've never seen that before. And it was green instead of yellow. Uh, and I started laughing. So I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, that's a funny, funny synchronicity, isn't it? I've just been thinking that I'm talking to extraterrestrials. I go straight upstairs and see that. And that's the first thing I see. Uh, and I looked at it and it was stuck on the outside. So it was actually stuck like you couldn't get to it. You'd have to be on the roof to put it there. And I just, at that point, I was like, right, like, you know, part of me was thinking, is this some sort of candy camera scene? Is someone going to jump out and say, oh, we fooled you kind of thing? But at the same time, I knew what I'd been through. So I was like, well, no, that's an internal experience I had. That wasn't, you know, that's, you can't fake that. So I just started, I think I just started laughing, basically. And I was just like, well, at least they've got a sense of humor. Um, um, you know, a few more things like that happened, similar sorts of things. And, and I gradually just sort of came to be at ease with it. And I was like, well, all right, everything's vibrating. Everything is not as concrete and solid as we think it is, basically. So why not? Why can't you just make things manifest? You know, if you've got, if you know that, if you if you come from a civilization that's known that for a million, 10 million years, obviously you're going to be able to do pretty interesting things with your thoughts and be able to manifest things in an interesting way. 
So I just relaxed into it and just thought, well, okay, well, I feel like I'm more at home with that kind of thinking than I am with, you know, the, the earth culture of humanity and how we've been taught to think about life. So, you know, even though it's way out there and completely different, I was like, well, I feel more comfortable with that. So I'm, I'll go with it. Um, and there lots of things happened, uh, which I won't go into now about that. But um, at some point I was driving back, uh, it's probably about, 10 30 11 30 at night had a friend in the car who i won't name because he went on to become kind of famous and i don't think he wants that attention but anyway um we were driving along and as as i drove probably about 20 miles away from from the renovation forest on the a11 a road is called um i got a shock of energy up my spine and I, um basically which i'd never experienced before and it caused my head to turn to the left so basically I couldn't, it wasn't like I chose to do it. It was more, it wasn't forceful. It wasn't like a controlling thing. It, it's hard to put into words. It's, it's, it's almost like it came from within me, a deep part of me that could sense what was happening. But at the time I wasn't so familiar with that deep part of me. So I just didn't really know what was happening. Um, and, and basically my, my head turned to the left and in the exact moment my head stopped, my eyes were resting on a light ship hovering um, probably about 100 meters away uh, above the tree line. As, it's hard to say how big it was because it was nighttime and it was just a very pure red color. It didn't really have any defining features as such. It was just an energy um, form. And I would say it was about the size of a house, but it's hard to really say. And it was very, very, very bright, like the brightest red you could create on a computer screen. Um, and then it had underneath uh, a wavy line that was orange. And it was, a, it was as I remember, it was um, an equilateral triangle. Um, so a complete triangle and I just looked at it and you know I was still driving as well and, and, I, and I basically just it was like I had all this stress release basically as soon as I saw that because I've been so stressed about all these things that happened in the previous few days about what was going on and were ETs real was any of this really happening or was it all just my mind breaking down and joining dots that shouldn't be joined kind of thing um, but you know was I going to have to spend 10 years fixing my brain or was I being extraterrestrials basically uh, and when I saw this vehicle I still didn't know if I was hallucinating or not but you know I could sense that it must be real from the fact that I'd had this shock of energy you know that that's just tangible to me it's a personal thing but I knew it happened um, so I turned to my friend and, and just said what do you think that is and I pointed at him pointed at it and I was I'm, you know, I'm a scientific person I'm very specific in the way that I perceive things I actually was watching his pupils as he looked at it like, I, you know, I'm driving a car. I wasn't, like, hysterical. I had to retain presence enough to not die, basically, as I'm driving. So I was very focused. And I just was looking at his pupils to make sure he actually focused on the object, to make sure he could see it. And I, because he might deny it, right? He might just pretend it wasn't there or something. Um, but he did. His eyes totally focused on exactly like I would expect them to. So I knew he saw it. And he looked back at me and just went, drive! Like, just just, just became terrified, basically. And, and I think he thought I was going to pull over or he was going to attack us or I don't know. But um, So I probably would have pulled over if, if he hadn't have said that. But it's, it's difficult to pull over there. I would have had to have driven a few miles and then, you know, it wasn't so easy. But um, So, yeah, and that was that. And we just drove off and that was the end of that experience. Um, um, it's taken me a few years to sort of understand what that was and why I saw it then and why it was the shape it was and all of these details. Um, and obviously no one, it's not like you get sent a, an email that explains, oh, by the way, yeah, this happened because of this, it happened because of this. It's like, no, you have to do a lot of research to understand what's going on. And um, But I have a fairly good interpretation of it now that makes sense to me at this point in my life. Um, and... Part of that actually ties into, I mean, this might be completely wrong. You know, maybe maybe, maybe at some point in 10 years' time, I'll meet someone from the military and say, oh, yeah, that was one of ours. Yeah, yeah, right, we put it there to send this signal to. I don't know, but um, my current interpretation is that basically uh, I've been, I've been getting into studying esoteric topics and sacred geometry, and obviously that ties into ancient mystery school religions and um, temples and earth geometry and all these things, which they were expert at. And, um, you know, obviously, if, if you, um, there are there are many people who have spoken about the interactions with these kind of vehicles who have talked about going under the earth and how, you know, these vehicles are connected into ancient cultures and so on. And basically, the fact that this vehicle was bright red ties into like the root chakra and survival energy. And um, the triangle obviously is a power symbol uh, in terms of it's a very strong shape. And so... What I now feel when I look back at that was that it was basically 
I was somebody who was very focused in my indigo energy center, my visual center. My third eye was, you know, open basically. And, um, and I feel like that was a signal telling me, I know you need to go down to, into your route basically to actually, you know, it's very, very, very important. You need to do this. Um, it's, you know, we could send a, a squadron of angels to come and say hello or something like that. But actually, no, what's more important is that you focus into your root chakra. And it's so important that you're actually going to have this life changing experience. Um, but, but no one actually explained that to me. So it's taken me years for me to study the energy centers and, and put the pieces together. Um, and I feel like that energy that came up my spine was from my root energy. And so I have done a lot of work into connecting into my, my root energy to heal myself and to empower myself. And, you know, the fact that it was next to or near to Rendlesham, I feel like that's, you know, you could say, oh, well, it probably means that it was a US military project or, or it was the same consciousness that, was present during that Rendlesham experience because uh, the triangle shape was prevalent then as well, and that's documented. It probably was uh, part of the same consciousness, but I feel like part of why that appeared there to me was A, because I happened to be driving past, and B, because um, it was important for me to look into that case and just to sort of tie these dots together because there's so many dots to tie together from that experience that happened there. Um, connects in, you know, secret military programs, non-human consciousness, um, uh, telepathy, um, government cover-ups, all these different things, which I wasn't really that focused into at that time. It was all a new thing to me. So, um, yeah, it was just a big landmark in my life. And um, so I spent a few years after that because the internet had just become – the internet was just growing to be a big thing at that time, big phenomenon, lots of social media sites popping up. So I was able to meet lots of people for the first time. It was like the whole world started to come together and I was able to communicate about interesting things which we've never been able to do before so it just so happens to coincide with that and i was able to then listen to lots of voices on these subjects uh from shamans to physicists to channelers to um experiences to you know you name it pretty much i listened to all of them and um so at a certain point um i also had other experiences as well with other flying vehicles um at least well there was one metal one that flew over my house um quite high up and did a sort of loop as I looked at it. Um, and But the other, the biggest one probably was when I was, I mean, this to many people, this will sound impossible. And, you know, if somebody had told me this, I would probably have said it was impossible. But um, I'm just going to tell you what happened. Basically, I, I went to uh, the Reading Music Festival in 2007, which is a big one of the biggest music festivals in England. Um, and... Uh, you know, at the time I was a fan of the Smashing Pumpkins. I've always liked them, and they were headlining. They were playing uh, the last night, the last show, and I went just down for that day with my friend. And basically, um, uh, an Indian, a guy called Indian in the Machine, who some people may have heard of, who basically is a kind of Indian American shaman, um, tribal guy. Uh, I was talking to him, I just happened to be talking to him before this event, and he said, oh yeah, this weekend is going to be a really great weekend for having, you know, ET experiences, basically. Take your camera. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And I, I just sort of laughed. I didn't really believe him, to be honest. I just thought, you know, people tell me things all the time, and I wasn't really, I didn't really have any particular reason to think that he must be right. Um, but, you know, he did. He was in my mind as a result of that. Anyway, I was, I'd been doing yoga as well at that time, and I was getting into energy work, and Basically, I was, it was pitch black, very dark night. The moon was full and I was right in the front of the stage and it was the last show. So there was like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 people in the crowd. And, you know, if you've ever been to one of those big events, sometimes it's so crammed that you can lift your feet from the ground and you don't fall over. And that, that's how it was. I was being held up by the crowd and I literally did that just for fun. Um, and at some point I was like, well, all right, well, I create my own reality. That's what I was learning about. All right, well, I want to have a bit more space around me. So I meditated into my heart and just sort of set the intention to create a bit more space. Uh, and, you know, it took, I don't know, a minute or so. And then I came back to this reality and, oh, there's space. Like people have actually moved. And I was just, like everyone else was completely crammed in and there was this bubble around me of just space. And I just started laughing. I was like, wow, this is awesome. Uh, you know, no one's ever going to believe me if I tell them this. And I can't really explain it to anyone, but I'm just going to enjoy the moment. Um, and so anyway, I just kept looking up because... The sky was so massive and clear, and I just felt like I just I guess I just had intuition to just telling me, you know, yeah, nothing's happened yet this weekend, so this would be the moment that it would happen if it was going to happen. So I just kept looking up. 
And then eventually, I don't know, maybe halfway through the show, bearing in mind this was um, 2007, I didn't have a lot of money, I didn't have a decent phone, phones didn't have good cameras, so you know, I couldn't really film anything. I, I wasn't a photographer, I didn't have a good camera, but definitely wasn't going to take one into the crowd anyway if I did have one. But um, basically I saw this orange light in the distance um, and I just thought, that's interesting, it doesn't really look like anything I would think of normally in the sky, so I just kept watching it. And it got closer and closer and closer and closer, and then eventually actually flew over me and the crowd, like directly. And it, again, can't tell you exactly how high, how high it was, but it was quite low. I would say, maybe it's very hard to say, but maybe two or three hundred meters off the ground, something like that. Um, again, probably the size of a house. Uh, and it, this one was circular, like a don't, uh, like a disc shape. And but but it wasn't metal; it was plasma. Basically, it was very bright, like orange, yellow, and red. Um, pulsing and moving all the lights were sort of moving around and there were a bunch of white small things with it as well um that i thought looked like a flock of birds I th at first i thought it was a flock of birds and a spotlight was hitting them because they were so bright that was my, my rational brain sort of saying well that must be what it is but then obviously since they were next to a giant ufo i was kind of like well no actually they probably aren't are they so i just kept watching it and basically the, they were moving like a flock of, like a, like when you see fish in the ocean moving as a school and they're sort of pulsing repulsing off of each other and they're sort of moving in relation to each other that's what they were doing it seemed like there was they were mag magnetically relating to each other that's the best way i can put it um and so it flew over my head, flew over the crowd, flew off towards the moon, the direction where the moon was, uh, and then just gradually disappeared into the distance. And I was absolutely screaming at this time, like to my friend. And I obviously, like the problem, what I thought, I thought basically, there's sixty thousand people here. This is a major event. There's cameras everywhere. Like this would definitely be recorded on high quality cameras somewhere. It must be because you couldn't miss it. Well. <laughs> um, Basically, I, I was screaming, screaming, screaming. No one heard me because it was so loud. But the only person who did hear me, hear me was my friend. This is a different friend to the one that was with me before. I also can't mention him because he's also doing things where he can't really, you know, he wouldn't want his name associated with this. But anyway, um, I screamed and pointed to this vehicle. I was like, look at this. And again, I watched his pupils. And, and yeah, he focused on it. But he basically couldn't process it. He, Like my other friend, you know, it's like this denial process kicks in. And it's like shock basically it's actual shock it's, it's like not in any way prepared for it and just kind of you know your whole belief systems and everything surrounding reality just get majorly destroyed uh and and <laughs> and, and yeah he definitely wasn't ready for it at all he was there just watching a band you know kind of like wow i really love this band oh it's ufo um so yeah uh, <laughs> um but anyway yeah my memory of what happened after that is a little bit fuzzy i know we drove home and we had we did talk about it a bit but he, I don't think he could really process it. He wasn't really ready for it. Um, but anyway, I didn't really know what to do with that because, yeah, it didn't it didn't come out on any cameras anywhere. I looked on the internet at the time, and one person did report it um, who wasn't at the festival. They were like 100 miles away, and they, they, they repeat, reported seeing the same vehicle. Um, and so that, again, settled me a bit and made me sort of think, well, yeah, I know for sure that that wasn't a hallucination. Um, but that taught me a lot about frequency and energy and perception and the fact that, you know, it's possible for people's belief, belief systems and readiness to actually affect what they see and what they will accept as being real and what they filter out. And it's possible that there's UFOs flying around all the time that, that no one sees because they're not mentally capable of accepting that they exist, basically, and they just filter it out. Um, but I didn't really talk to anyone. I, I think I did tell my parents about it and they just probably thought I was crazy and just, you know, just like, yeah, whatever. Um, and uh, so I didn't really mention it to anyone because, like I said, I don't like talking about things unless I've got evidence because it's just, you know, I know that I was a sceptical person and I would have just laughed at these, you know, if someone had told me they'd seen something like that, I would just laugh at them, really. So I was just like, well, I can't expect anyone to, to trust me or my what I say any more than I would have trusted anyone else. So I just won't really talk about it. Um, but then, thankfully, like just, I don't know, a few years later, my mind was completely blown when a guy that I know in America who's into these things posted a picture onto his profile on social media of exactly the vehicle that I'd seen, high quality photo. And I was like, whoa, like my brain sort of exploded. And I was like, full of hundreds of questions, you know, where the hell did you get this? You know, I never thought I'd see this. Um, and it turns out that uh, a guy called Carlos Diaz in, in Mexico uh, a documentary was made about him because he was actually meeting this exact vehicle regularly, physically going onto it and being taken into um, underground areas like like Mayan type 
um, sacred spaces uh, and so on, and being educated using um, highly unusual spiritual technology, let's say, uh, about certain things to do with the earth. And so they made a documentary about it. And he was he was a journalist, and he actually took photos of this vehicle a few times. And then, as I recall, they actually invited one of the Mexican universities to come down and examine it. So it was going to manifest for them. And they basically were like, well, yeah, it's not real, but we'll go down anyway. Um, and then there's footage, video footage of it manifesting in front of them, like just suddenly comes on um, at ground level and they're just terrified and run off basically. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and then other people have talked about this same vehicle as well, claiming that it comes from within the earth and, you know, it does seem to be the case. So, um yeah, uh, you know, I had some level of communication with that energy as well. and. I feel like the fact that that was red, orange, and yellow, and the other one was red and orange, and these are the lower energy colors, in, not lower in terms of value, but lower in terms of frequency. Um, they're more earth energies. They're, they're more related to solidity and physical reality. Um, they're very grounding kind of energy, and the, to, the idea that these come from the earth to me makes perfect sense. Um, and other people have said that, that, that I think there's a name that was given to these as Mahayana, um, I might be butchering that word, but uh, no, Yama, yeah, uh, it's a long time since I looked at that, but it's a word like that anyway, um, which is a specific word from Sanskrit or related languages, which refers to geometrical forms of consciousness that manifest in the universe, which you can see and experience. Um, and basically, they're symbolic, let's say, but potentially also a vehicle as well. And that's really as much as I can say. They're, they're like pre matter, they're, they're basically a form of plasma that's pre matter. So um, somewhere in between light and matter, um, and able to move through matter as well. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of that was a lot of good stories all together, man. Thank you for sharing so much. I've actually seen the white orb looking things at a music festival myself with okay. the, with collaborating witnesses. The they look like to me they are about the size of a very large beach ball. There are about five of them. They rose up out of the ground, like we literally saw them come out of the ground as if they're phasing through the matter, and they kind of danced around in the air in front of us and then flew off. This happened to be at the time of a huge full total solar eclipse two years ago that was visible where I was at. But yeah, I totally feel what you're saying about the whole grounding in the root chakra whenever you explore these topics, really taking your health into uh, priority. Because when this kundalini energy rises up from the spine and lights up the upper centers, if there's a lot of like distortion or low vibration in those energy centers below, then it's going to affect what you're perceiving and manifesting and generating through those upper chakra systems, like the third eye. So it makes a lot of sense that you interpreted it that way later. And perhaps you were kind of given a download through perceiving that, that you've then unpacked through your behavior without necessarily even realizing why you were drawn to certain types of information. So bravo to, to the whole story. <laughs> really bravo, amazing. Bravo to the universe. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, man, let's take uh, our time to wrap things up. You can have the floor to close off, tie any loose ends that you might feel were left open and remind everyone where they can find you online and I'll go from there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you can, as always, find me on eureka.org, U-R-E-K-A.org, uh, which now has Steam features built into it. So you can find me on the Steam blockchain as well. My username on there is Eurosoul, which is U-R-A hyphen S-O-U-L. Um, eureka now has Steam features, so you can actually come and blog on, on Eureka and get paid in Steam tokens, just like you can on other Steam sites. So that's pretty exciting. And there's also a new Steam site um, called 3Speak, which I'm on. Uh, 3speak.online, which is a video platform, and it's basically there to take, it's it's initially it's, it's there as a home for people that have been deplatformed and censored on other networks uh, to actually have an uncensored place to host video, videos indefinitely. So previously we had D.Tube, we still do have D.Tube, um, but they, they only hold your videos for 30 days. But now 3speak actually holds your videos forever. Um, so we've actually got an uncensored version of YouTube uh, which is reliable and which actually pays you to post as well. So um, that's pretty exciting. I'm definitely putting more videos up on there and you can actually load those into Eureka as well right now. So um, really supporting that. 
and there's quite a few um, people who are moving on to there who have been censored, who are quite well known. Tommy Robinson being one example from Britain, um, who's just been through a big court case here. Um, and yeah, I could go off on tangents all relating to all this stuff to do with Trump and his social social media summit that he had with all these alleged right wing people. And Bill Ottman from Mines got invited down there and Vice called him a Nazi basically. And it's just it's just all lies. Like Bill Ottman isn't a Nazi, it's completely ridiculous. But anyway, um yeah, the the world of, of freedom online is definitely evolving and I would just ask people to remember to uh do something to participate and do your bit, even if it's just opening a profile on, on the site and, and not putting so much time into Facebook. It all, it all helps. I couldn't agree more. And you're going to be a lot more likely to meet like-minded individuals and be exposed to information that could empower you rather than the same circles of people that you've always known and the same, <laughs> like just the same old random status updates from people that don't necessarily equate to life-changing or world-shattering info that you, you know, I took my dog on a walk today. Well, that's a great status update and I approve of that. But <laughs> what about what's going on in the world? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure to speak, man. This is maybe the best one yet, especially because of the epic stories you've told about your own personal awakening experience. I can't believe it took this long to get that out of you, but I'm really <laughs> glad we did. It was awesome. I'm glad to share it. Yeah, it's, I feel like these things need a certain amount of background um, information before I, you know, really want to speak a lot about them because they're definitely not the kind of thing you can just open with in a conversation. That's true, but this is interverse, and I have a lot of faith in our audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, Excellent. Th thanks, man. It's been awesome, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. See you all soon. Uh, about an hour of talking about aliens, UFOs, ET contact, and the spiritual connection that allows this type of thing is not interesting to you. I don't know what is. I found this conversation to be utterly fascinating and really impressed with the depth of it, interesting stories and information and knowledge that you're a soul brings to the show every time. It seems like whenever I talk to him, there's just more layers to the onion that is this amazing human being. And I hope you guys will check out eureka.org if you've never been there, especially if you're interested in Steam and using Steamit as a social media tool that actually helps you generate a little bit of cryptocurrency based income because I think he mentioned it, but I'll reiterate that Steam and eureka.org are now integrated. And a little more about Eureka, I'll just tell you, it's a great site. The functionality is quite extensive. You can pretty much do everything there that you would do on any other type of social media, but all in one place. And I especially appreciate how easy it is to collect your thoughts and your posts and your information under different tags and certain ways of organizing that so that it's easier to keep track of and share with other people later, which is one of the biggest problems about Facebook. It's like, Things are on your wall and then they're kind of lost in the memory hole unless you go and surf through the wall. I, mean, I guess Facebook has a feature to let you save posts to collections, but I didn't even know about that till recently and I hadn't really been using it. Not that Facebook's the greatest place to go source information anyway, but Eureka is a good place to source information. And although it's a smaller network and maybe your high school buddies aren't on there, you will find a lot of individuals that are interested in all the same stuff that we talk about on the show and a lot more. So do check out Eureka.org. I'm going to keep talking about it and keep using it even beyond this episode because I think it's far beyond time that we start implementing solutions to the social media craziness that we're seeing right now and the polarization in that place. And like 
the soul sucking time destroying dopamine addiction that is the whole Facebook world and I guess Instagram and pretty much every everything from the mainstream for that matter, but especially the polarization between political sides and yeah, I mean, there's so much to it that's a bummer. And Eureka is everything heart centered and earth centric that you would want in an online format or forum to be talking to other awakening souls and individuals. So check out Eureka.org. That's U R E K A dot org. Make a profile there. Say what's up to me. I'm sure you can find me if you search for chance or interverse or something. And it'd be great to have you there. And don't forget about that Steam integration because you can actually make money off your posts and it's pretty simple to do it. I actually converted some of my steam to real United States dollars at one point recently. Uh, I guess I had to convert it to Bitcoin first, but it's not that complicated. It used to be, but it's getting simpler all the time. And generally speaking, I think this is the future for currency, at least for the time being, it seems like the future for good or bad that we're going to be more digitized than ever going forward as the technology of our planet continues to evolve at a furious pace in some places and at a standstill in other places. Because, you know, we did just spend like at least an hour talking about UFOs and anti-gravitic craft and ideas about that stuff. And it seems to me that that's been around for quite a while, yet we're still driving around on exploding oil, combustion engine, four-wheeled cars. I don't like that. I think that we could do better, but it's a matter of getting the information to the people and then the people taking it into their own hands to make something different. And that's always what it is. We can't wait on governments or authorities to give us something that we really need because at the end of the day, the entire game behind corporations and the government is a corporation is to steal something from you sneakily and then sell it back to you in a worse form. Across the board, that's pretty much what it is, especially when it comes to food. But hey, we went deep into just what's going on with <laughs> the state and the mind control programs and psychological warfare in the plus extension. If you want more of this whistleblower topic, we definitely went thoroughly down some rabbit holes in the second hour including, as I just mentioned, talking about Michael Aquino, which is a, he's like a, a colonel or a general in the military, who's also the head of the Church of Set, or was at one point, which is an offshoot of Satanism. And he was in charge of, I guess, like religion in general for the army for quite some time. And many people implicate that guy in some horrible stuff, especially with ritual abuse and MK Ultra mind control style programs. Of course, his name's been cleared officially by official investigations, but as we find when we look into the official story behind things, usually it's quite lacking or even a twist of the truth to the point of being basically a complete lie. So beyond the psychological warfare and mind control stuff, we talked about something really interesting. Back to the Future and 9-11 predictions in mass media. That's pretty cool. I watched the video that he suggested about the ways that Back to the Future actually foretells the 9-11 event. And it's really weird. To be frank, it can have happened by coincidence. Something was up with that. And I'll link the video in the show notes. I mean, actually, there's about 12 different links to information in the show notes. If you go pull those up, if you want to explore any of the topics that we discussed today, plus show or free show. I put as much information in there as I could for you to explore and expand on yourself and make up your own mind if we are talking craziness or if this is reality. But the interesting thing about the Back to the Future 9-11 connection is in that video, the guy talks about how the point that we've reached now is like the media monolith is becoming in our hands. It's now ours to manipulate, you know. The monolith in 2001 A Space Odyssey is a big black rectangle thing and it's shiny and reflective. We're all carrying around a miniaturized version of that monolith. And like the apes in in a, a Space Odyssey, we're staring at these things constantly, practically worshiping them. So is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It depends on you 
And if you're going to take that media monolith into your own hands and use the tools that we now have to create something different, and that's all up to us to do. And no one can stop us because the truth is our connectivity is not technological, it's spiritual. And everything that we have technologically is a reflection or even in some cases a plagiarization of our spiritual abilities. So while we're still working on the ability to be completely linked telepathically and share information at will and communicate like that across vast distances, which technically we can do, it's good to use the external tools that we do have access to to share light, enlightening information and find ways to balance the fractal we're in with truth. More about the plus extension, we talked about multiverse theories through the lens of unity consciousness, the mysterious off-world council of nine, supposedly guiding but possibly manipulating humanity, and how your soul was, I guess, invited to to work with them in some capacity, and that was a very weird story. Speculations on the pros and cons of channeling, talked about human trafficking and sexual abuse of minors among the rich and powerful, including the Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein case. And how and why cults practice energy harvesting, harvesting rituals on the innocent, because that's a big question. Why would that be happening? And then at the end, he gave us an update on the class action lawsuit against Facebook and Google for restricting cryptocurrency ads. So if you want to get the plus extension, just like always, it's on patreon.com forward slash interverse. Check the show notes for a link to that as well. Five bucks a month gets you three to five shows, depending on what I can manage, extended to two hours or so. And also the huge archive of like 70 extended shows that I've done in the past. And trust me, if you like the podcast, you are missing half of it if you're not on Plus. And as much as I don't like to pay well things, I'm trying to figure out a way to turn my passion into something that can support me a little bit more. And the only way to do that that I can currently conceive of is by doing these Plus extensions. And also, I like it. I think it's a good model because we do give plenty of good content in the first hour And for those that are wanting to take the deep dive, I think it's appropriate that maybe you should give a little something back because I definitely put hours and hours into this show and researchers like your soul put hours and hours into what they are doing, both in creating content and in just looking into these deep and dark corners of the world. And you might have wondered from the jump if you're newer to the show or if you had a certain idea of what this show was about that Why are we even talking about conspiracies and whistleblowers? I think maybe it's clear to a lot of you, but as artists, which you are, whether or not you think you are, but I assume if you're listening to the show, you probably are interested in opening up the imagination and being more creative. Well, if that's who you are, what is the purpose of that ability or the purpose of that calling? Yes, it is to make cool things and delight the eyes and ears of those who witness what you're doing. But there's also a deeper purpose. And whether that purpose is to bring awareness to something happening in the environment or to help depolarize the left and right amongst our tribe of humanity or any other thing, knowledge is power. And that's the place to start. I don't necessarily think that people who are painters need to start painting things that somehow point people to UFO disclosure or something like that. But just keep in mind that everything that you do that other people perceive, especially artistically, is planting seeds in their unconscious. And if those seeds happen to be containing kernels of truth, then even if the person doesn't necessarily recognize it or it's allegorical, you're putting it in a place where it has a chance to sprout and grow and develop into a tree of love and kindness and wisdom, depending on what you're putting in there. And some artists do the exact opposite. They kind of channel their darkness into their art as like a container for them to get it out of them. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but what if we're channeling truth into our creations? What if we're channeling love and unity and higher consciousness into what we're making? And I know a lot of you have that intention. So even if you're not necessarily going to talk about certain conspiracies that are very true in the form of your artwork, the fact is as you become more known for what you create, you have built yourself a platform by which other people are looking at you and respecting you, and you have a chance to make a difference in the world 
by bringing light to the darkness, especially the darkest corners of our human experience in the form of things like human trafficking, mind control, psychological warfare, and government shenanigans. So I really do think it's important for artists to know what needs healing in the world so they can speak the truth to their work in all capacities, whether that's making YouTube videos or writing a book or any number of things that could have a positive impact on your brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. It is important. And I think a lot of you probably already realized that, that your calling has a lot more to do with enlightening the world than it does just as a way for you to make money or support yourself. Not that it's wrong to just be an artist who is making whatever they want for the sake of supporting themselves. It isn't. But you have an opportunity to, <laughs> yeah, shine your light into some, some places that really need it. So that's what I'm trying to do. I hope you like the show. And also, I do find conspiracy stuff to be pretty interesting because it takes a high level of coordination and intelligence and possibly even non-human help in terms of some of how these conspiracies unfold. So fascinating stuff definitely opens up the imagination just to realize that there's likely a lot more going on in our world than what meets the eye and uh, probably a lot of you already realize that so it's a great time to be talking about this stuff and i appreciate you for being with me one more thing i want to mention is the music i'm playing at the end of this episode is by cadella great friend of mine awesome music producer and he just released this new ep and it's extra cool because it's got the title for the sea which is referring to the fact that all the proceeds from this ep are being donated to a foundation to rescue sea turtles out of key west florida and sea turtles are known as the protectors of the sea so they're important to a lot of other organisms on the ocean and of course we're at the top of the food chain in a sense but that means that everything that happens below us affects us including what happens to the turtles so check out the For the Sea EP, repost it somewhere, show it to somebody, or even buy it online, or contact Cadella directly, send them a donation to put towards it, and they'll send you a copy of the EP, even though you can listen to it for free. I think it's really worth supporting this noble mission, and very cool of Austin from Cadella for doing this for the turtles and for our planet. So make sure you check that out, soundcloud.com forward slash Cadella, K-A-D-L-A, and one of my favorite bands, probably the most featured music on the show ever and it's going to stay that way as long as he keeps putting it out uh but that's it for me i always somehow run into 15 plus minutes on these things when i thought i had nothing to say but <laughs> i guess i do once i get going as odd as it is to just stand in front of a mic and talk to the only people in the room which are a cat and dog it somehow all comes out and flows whenever i'm connecting to you all through the airwaves and i appreciate your attention and your energy and your support for the podcast, support it by subscribing to Plus or sharing it with a friend, posting it online, whatever you can do, get it out there. I really love you and every little bit helps. So thanks for being with me on this journey and I'll see you next week. We've got a fascinating talk about astro yoga coming up. So what's that? Google it. <laughs> no, I'll tell you real quick. Astro yoga is when you align your yoga practices with astrology and with the seasons. Pretty cool stuff and had a great time with that interview. Can't wait to get it published to you all. Big things on the horizon beyond that. Interverse just keeps on rolling into territories I never could have imagined it would go and I love it. It's definitely what I'm here to do. So thanks for doing it with me. I'll see you next week. Much love. Much love.